feet. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We hit a portion in Romans that we want to recognize and we want to understand similar to Romans chapter 3 in verse 21. Let's go there for a moment before I even explain the significance of Romans chapter 1 verse 7 that I believe so many of us uh, sometimes oversee or we just don't see clearly. Romans chapter 3 Looking at verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's a big portion of scripture. It's a big deal. It's a but now. It's the righteousness of God and it's dispensation of the grace of God that, that not just can, but must be recognized as being able to be imputed to someone today without the righteousness of the law. Without trying to keep the law that was given to Israel doing their prophecy program. Amen. And when we say Israel and their prophecy program, we're talking about time past and Jesus Christ according to that time past program. Uh, now back to Romans chapter 1, verse 7. It reads, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I am convinced that that is a monumental, also first-time statement that today we will look at and draw truths from, that when we see Romans chapter 1, verse 7, <clears throat> first of all, we never want to lose track that it's the book of Romans. And when we say the book of Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, it's pointing to an understanding of the time past prophecy program and who are the people predominantly in mind in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Israel. Israel. We are now in the book of Romans and the focus now is we have to understand salvation, justification, sanctification, glorification, the righteousness of God without the law, without Israel program, without an understanding of Jesus Christ according to the prophecy program. And we're going to look at it, we're going to recognize, we're going to see, we need to be mind blown with Romans chapter 1 verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. This is the first time in the Pauline writings that you are seeing a Gentile without recognizing and acknowledging any of the time past program, how they were to receive salvation and justification, with no acknowledgement of Israel and their rise. Bless them and God will bless you. No acknowledgement of that. You got Gentiles being called beloved of God. You got Gentiles being called saints. And I say again, with no connection to any reverence, to any honor, to any esteeming Israel in a time past program. You ever watch the movie and it started at a at a point that it, you didn't it didn't seem like it started like, hey, this is in the this is the middle of the movie. How can the movie start this way? And then an hour and a half it find a way to get back to that point, the way the movie started, and you got an hour and a half of information to be like, okay. In the beginning, it didn't reveal to me why that was such a significant part of the movie. But it spent an hour and a half explaining why this is the part of the movie that, that was all the way from back there that gave insight now when you read it again or now when you see that part in the movie I want to have you go that was awesome <laughs> the way they put that together at once what I first saw the first two or three minutes of the movie hour and a half later is amplified is magnified is glorified and it get a raise it get it get high honors in the sights of Hollywood is anybody with me with that 
And once again, when you read Romans chapter 1, verse 7, you got to approach it and see how it's so brand new, how it's so exciting, how it's so exhilarating to all that be in Rome. And the one thing that we want to recognize when we're looking at this in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, and I want a, a bright color. Let me, Pastor Scott, someone back there, let me know how this color is, is uh, seen back there. It's a word that, the word that we want to, this word beloved and this word saints. We go do a brief word summary because you got, excuse my right, we got Gentiles being called the beloved of God and Gentiles being called saints. Now, this is only a big deal to you if you recognize that they are being called that with, with no connection to their time, past, history, or understanding. <clears throat> to all that being wrong, this is essential for us living in this age, embrace the dispensation of the grace of God. But when you open Paul letters, the book after Rome, Romans is the book of Corinth. After, after the Corinthian book, you go to Galatia or Galatians, the, the, Galatia, uh, the country of Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae. All these books, all these countries that Paul went to, this is essential for them to recognize this as they read the book of Romans. As I read the book of Romans as a, as a saint, as a member of the body of Christ, the introduction of the book is to give me such a view of how and what has happened to the point that now I'm called beloved of God. The moment you put your trust in, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, there's things that have happened that Paul and now in the book of Romans are going to lay out <coughs> benefits that you have that until you read the book of Romans, you totally have no idea of. You have no idea about these benefits. Uh, the beloved of God, I want us to turn to John chapter 14, verse 6 for a moment. John chapter 14 and verse 6. This is a, this is a big deal. <clears throat> this is, this is a interdispensational truth. John 14 and 6. Jesus said, saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by who? But by me. When you see this word, uh, beloved, and it's, and it's not in that verse, I want you to recognize that the definition of the word, it's someone dear. It's not just someone dear to God, it's someone that's pleasing to God. Be loved. And we're going to look at some time past verses, and then we're going to bring it up to speed. Uh, Deuteronomy 33. Let's go to Deuteronomy 33. We're going to look at some characters in, in, in time past, and we want to see how the Word of God uses this word, be loved. Deuteronomy chapter 33. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 12. And it reads, And of Benjamin, this is Moses blessing the twelve tribes of Israel. And of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover all the day, and, and the Lord, excuse me, shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. This is Benjamin, the, one of the tribes of Israel. And you can see that Benjamin was a significant tribe of the tribe of Israel to the point that even in Philippians chapter 3, you see Paul esteem how he was of the tribe of Benjamin, how he was circumcised the eighth day. And then let's go to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah. Chapter 13, right before the book of Esther. What I want you to hang on to is that word beloved. 
Benjamin was called the beloved of the Lord, the tribe of Benjamin. Nehemiah 13, 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women God caused to sin. Uh, you remember the story, David, God did not allow to build the temple. His son Solomon would build it. Solomon did many things that pleased the Lord. But Solomon also, as you look at our Nehemiah, he also did some things with women that was against the laws that was given to Israel. Psalms chapter 60. The book of Psalms chapter 60, you want to read verses 1 through 5. Verse 1 reads, O God, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us, though thou hast been displeased. O turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble, thou hast broken it. Heal thy breaches thereof, it shaketh. Thou hast showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth, Selah. That thou beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and hear me. We're looking at these passages to see that the God called Solomon beloved, God called Benjamin beloved, God has now called Israel beloved, and he has scattered them. Now, once again, what we want to recognize is they was dear to God. We just, what we want to do in this word study is acknowledge that they were dear to God. But what were they? Who were the tribe of Benjamin? Who were or who was Solomon? Who is Israel? They were Jews. They was his firstborn. Amen. They were his beloved. They were dear to him. They were to please him. Amen. They were. As we move on, I want you to look at verse 1 again of Psalm 60. Stay with me. Please, please catch the significance of this. O oh God, verse 1 says, Thou hast cast us off. Thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been what? Displeased. O oh, turn thyself to us again. This is Israel. Now, this is a big deal if you understand Leviticus 26 and you understand Deuteronomy 28. If you, don't got a, if you don't got a firm grasp on Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, it's sort of not a big deal. But let's shed some light on that. The, the, the first half of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, God tells Israel if they do and keep all his commands that they will be what? Blessed. They will be blessed. They will be the head. They will be not the, twel the, not the tail. They will be the lender and not the borrower. But when you look at the latter half of Leviticus 26 and the latter half of Deuteronomy 28, you don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 28, 64 says, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Nehemiah 1 and 8, remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou command, uh, the word that thou commandest, thy servant Moses, saying, "If ye transfer us, I will scatter you abroad among the nations." The beloved of God was scattered among the nations, and God had to, because God had to true faith. He had to prove faithful to His what word. He had to prove faithful to his word. If you would read the Old Testament and not see Israel scattered, you would be able to call God a what? Word. But we see you kept his word and they were scattered. Amen. Now what I want you to understand, although they was called beloved, we, we are saw in verse 1 that they did what? 
They displease God. Now turn with me to John chapter 8. I had to, the, 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 the tribe of Benjamin always do what's right in the sight of God. Did they always do what was right in the sight of God? Did the scripture call the tribe of Benjamin God's beloved? Yes. Did Solomon always do what is right in the sight of God? No. Did the scriptures call Solomon beloved of God? Did Israel always do, and I'm stressing this word, always do what is right in the sight of God? Were they still called the beloved of God? Okay. John chapter 8. <clears throat> I want you to look at me at verse 29. And just look at a brief statement that Christ made. 8 and 29. Christ in his earthly ministry says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that do what? Now understand, once again, the, the definition of the word beloved is to be, it's dear and pleasing to. Jesus Christ is the one that's dearest to God the Father, and no one pleases God the Father more than Jesus Christ. Amen? It's essential for us to know that Jesus Christ is the only one who walked the face of the earth that can say to all of mankind, I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. So, come with me now to Matthew chapter 3. In the opening portion of the book of Romans, and we will reread it again, it starts with just esteem in Christ. With just esteem in Christ. Talking about his power over the dead, his resurrection, just esteeming him, esteeming him. But this is the first time in Romans chapter 1 verse 7 that it makes now a reference to us Gentiles as having some connection with this Christ that they esteem. That's glorious. That's what, yeah, yeah, esteem him, esteem him. What's his connection with us though? Amen? What's his connection with us? Matthew chapter 3, brief statement. Let's look at verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. Well pleased. Now we remember when we was in Psalms, when we was in Nehemiah, when we was in Deuteronomy, they was called, and when I say they, I'm talking about ben, the tribe of Benjamin, King Solomon, and I'm also referring to Israel. They were called beloved, but we saw that God was displeased with them. Amen? We see God now, God the Father, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am what? Well, well pleased. And, and once again, we don't want to lose sight of the word beloved. Okay, chapter 12, same book, Matthew 12. Look at verse 18. Verse 18, Matthew 12, 18. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my what? My beloved, in whom my soul is what? Well, well, well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Matthew chapter 17, please. You see the connection of the word beloved and well pleased? Matthew chapter 17. Let's start at verse 1. This, this, I love reading this uh, portion of scripture. We're going to read the first five verses. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a, uh, to an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his, uh, uh, and, and his remnant, or his clothes, was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. 
Then answered Peter and said unto him, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, and one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well, well please hear ye him. Verse 6. Let's read verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus came up and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. Eight. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. This is a big deal because it's when you see what we see uh, aligned right here is Moses, Elias, and we see Christ. Or when I say Elias, Elijah, we see Christ. And they're esteeming, Peter, James, John are esteeming all three alike. Amen. Now we, we know that Moses and Elijah, they was part of Israel. Amen. They was they was members of Israel. So we understand that God called Israel in Psalm 60. We see that he called them, what's the B word? Beloved. The beloved. They are beloved, but what distinguishments or what uh, comparisons have we already saw? That they displease God occasionally from time to time. And in John chapter 8, verse 29, Christ says, I do always those things that please my Father. Always, always. He, meaning, he never displeases God. Jesus Christ have never displeased God, will never displease God, never, 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 never has, never will. Amen? Amen. Now, it's essential for us to know that, and when you read verse 5 again, while he yet spake, while Peter was asking for three tabernacles to be made, it gives us an understanding that Peter does not know the implications of how preeminent and how significant Jesus Christ is above and over Moses and Elias right here. Verse 5 reads, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, my dear son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Time after time again in the Gospels, we see God making a public announcement about how significant, how significant Christ is and dear to him. Hear ye him. Amen. God the Father is absolutely pleased with the sacrifice, absolutely pleased with the righteousness, and absolutely pleased with the person of God the Son. That person being Jesus Christ. Amen. Come with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Let's start at verse 3. Ephesians 1 and 3. Ephesians 1 and 3 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us what? Accepted, Accepted in the <coughs> Beloved, in the beloved. Once again, let's put ourselves, let's try to put ourselves back there. Almost 2,000 years ago, you are in Rome or, or you're somewhere in one of the churches that uh, of Galatia, Colossae, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth. You're there. And you get to chapter, you get to chapter 1 of Romans you're reading, and you get to verse 7. And what you have to keep in mind is you're a Gentile. You're a Gentile. And you read, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. If you understand your history as a Gentile in the time past program, that ought to make you scratch your head a little. 
Because that's a big deal. When you remember that in Matthew chapter 15, you reverence what Christ was doing. You called him son of David, son of David. And you told Christ. And I'm, I'm, I'm painting a picture of Matthew 15. And what you tell him is that your daughter is demon possessed. And the disciples next to him say, send her away. You're, you're reverencing Christ. And he says, and they say, send her away. And then you continue to have a conversation. And he says, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And now you get the Romans chapter 1 and you've got to ask yourself, what happened? How did I become beloved of God? I don't know about you, but to say and to call me a dog and then to call me beloved, those are not synonyms. <laughs> and once again, if you truly, and, and this is why the stumbling, this is why the stumbling of many churches today who don't respect how to rightly divide the word of truth. They don't believe that Paul was given this significant, special, unique mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God. They don't see a difference from Romans chapter 1 verse 7. And when you go to Matthew chapter 15 and you go to Luke chapter 7. That's right. Come with me to Luke chapter 7 for a moment. Let's get a little more clarity on that. Let's start at verse 1. Luke chapter 7. Let's start at verse 1. <coughs> verse 1 of Luke 7 reads, Now when he had ended all his sayings, in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the who? Of the Jews, beseeching, begging him, that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, look with the doctrine, the doctrine they have to approach Christ with. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him and is besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Five, for he loveth our nation, and he built us a synagogue. Do we understand how they besought Jesus? How they beseeched them? What verses come to your mind? What verses of time past come to your mind? Was that pastor? You may remember why they blessed him. Yeah. The Abrahamic, the Abrahamic covenant, right? Genesis chapter 12, right? Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. All families of the earth had to be blessed through that one nation who? Israel. Israel. Now, once again, I have to keep in mind when I am reading the book of Romans, even in chapter 1, is Israel the subject and their rise? It's Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Is Does it hold predominance when I turn to Romans chapter 1 and start reading from verse 1? The answer is no. And if I let it hold dominance, that is, that's why I can't see these things. That's why many can't see these things. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> in time past, I'm, I'm, I'm asking anyone who's in disagreement with this understanding of uh, that's here today or that's watching by video, uh, if you can find Gentiles in a time past period, apart from the nation of Israel, being called beloved, contact us, call us. There's a number at the bottom of the screen. There's email information there. If we are in error, we have no problem opening up the word of God and allowing you to, to, uh, to speak from it, and we will look verse by verse with you and investigate it with you. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 11. 
Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Let's see in time past what our status was. That at that time you were without who? Right. You were without who were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Can you be called the beloved of God in one breath and in the same breath say you without God have no hope in the world? Come on. This is a basic significant deal that many people miss. In verse 13, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of who? Christ. By the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. Back to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> let's start at verse 1 and let's just read let's start at verse 1 of Romans chapter 1 and I want you to see the quick transition of how it goes from talking and esteeming Christ and then it immediately goes into us beloved of God. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Do we see him in any way making an implication that this has any connection with Gentiles right now? Does, we don't hear that right now, do we? We hear Christ being esteemed, right? Now let, let's keep in mind everything that we see thus far in the book of Romans. It is all in connection and it's all accurate about Christ. But can you read verse 3 and 4 and say dispensationally verse 3 and 4 is telling me something about my inheritance as a Gentile in this dispensation of the grace of God? See, I'm, I'm just saying this is, this is a careful read. And when we close out, you show me if you see something. Verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome. We got to let that hit. To all that be in Rome. It doesn't say to all that be in Jerusalem. To all that be in Rome. The book of Romans itself is an amplified book of Gentiles. Amen? It's a book that's pointing to the benefits that we have in Christ without recognizing the time past prophecy program. Seven, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you. Just uh, listen along with me. Time is getting short. Psalms chapter 30, verse 4. It reads, saying good to the Lord, O ye saints of his and give thanks at their remembrance of his holiness. The definition for the word saints, we understand, is simply set apart unto God. Amen. Set apart for unique service unto him. Amen. And it's simply because he have in one way or another aligned you with the program of salvation during that time. With inside of the doctrine in that program, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Time past program gospel is not but now gospel. So when you hear, so when Israel of time past heeded the word of God that came to them, they were called what? What's the S word? Saints. Because they became saved that moment they put their trust in whatever gospel at that time was being proclaimed. So now we are called a saint. We are, we are made and imputed with the holiness of Jesus Christ. We belong to Christ and we are being called saints. But let's keep this in its proper perspective, totally without any connection to Israel and their prophetic program. Amen. Now, let's be honest. There's a lot of people when they read chapter one of Romans, verse seven, they don't really grasp that. That's the first time that we can even acknowledge in the writings about who are the saints at that time? Who is the beloved of God? And when we can say Gentiles, now show me beforehand that being the case. Show me. And they simply cannot, right? 
They simply cannot. Uh, Psalms chapter 50, verse 5, it reads, Gather my saints together unto me, those who have made a covenant with me. What I want you to recognize as I'm reading these verses, how personal the verses are with a connection to God. So listen for the word saints and then hear the connection of the words to follow. Psalms 55, 50 and 5, Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. You understand that's Israel in time past, right? Sure. The doctrine of time past instructed and commanded them to make sacrifices unto God, right? Psalms 85 and 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Once again, when you hear the word saint, you have to connect it to God. You have to connect it to the dispensational program and the doctrine that saves under that program. Saints are set aside or set aside unto God for a specific service. And Israel on time past, they followed with that service. They, they, they weren't always pleasing God in their service unto God. Amen? Uh, Paul makes a statement about how he persecuted the saints. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 13, he says, Then I deny his answer, Lord, I have heard many of this man, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. It's important for us to recognize and to understand that all the verses we just read about saints, that's saints of the time past, understanding. That's saints of the prophecy program connection. But now Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, and why don't you turn there with me? In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul makes a statement concerning him being a saint. And it reads, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all what? Saints, is this, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Go to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Look at verse 19. 2 19, Paul says concerning us Gentiles in this dispensation, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints, saints and of the household of God. As I read, as you read the book of Romans, you have to disconnect your understanding of who and what a saint was in time past and don't bring that into the but not. And as you do so, you want to keep in mind from everything I read from Romans chapter 1, from verse 7 on, everything I'm reading, I'm learning how the operation of God works in this dispensation of the grace of God. And, I'm, and as I read about the wrath of God, how it's revealed from heaven in, in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, I read it with a peace of mind. Amen. I read it with a peace of mind if I'm a saint. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, turn there, Ephesians 1 18. Paul says, and he's making a prayer for us, he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the who? Do you know all that the moment you put your faith and trust in the gospel? You have no idea that, that the benefits that are freely given to you because you are in Christ, because you belong to Christ, because you are the beloved of God, because you are a saint. You don't understand the rewards and the benefits that now you have free access to. And this is a rewarding, this is an awesome hope as we look forward in the book of Romans and we recognize all this apart and without any emphasis that we have to keep in any way the time past program that, that, that Israel had to keep. Amen. Amen. That's a dispensational truth. That's a historical truth in the word of God. And we silent, and I like it. I like it, but on the inside, I'm weeping and I'm jumping because I see something that's for the first time is ever seen. And throughout Scripture, a Gentile being called the beloved of God without acknowledging anything that Israel had to acknowledge. 
you're being called a saint with no connection to if you do this and if you do that. You are accepted in the beloved. There's not a thing that God will ever hold to get you to your account. It reminds me of last week's message. This is a no condemnation verse. I'm the wife of God. I'm called to be a saint. What can separate? Was there anything I can do that can separate me from this love now? Is there anything that I can do that in one way or another I can strip myself from being beloved of God? So you can't do it either. Neither can the world. Come on. Come on. And what I want you to recognize and understand as we bring it to a close, we go look at this word. We, we, we always, and we should, we should always hang on Amen. in Christ. We should always hang on in Him. But it's a word that's a that's, that's a synonym of that that we want to look at. We want to look at this word together. And that's the big deal. Because you're in Christ, you're together with his faithfulness. You're together with his accomplishments. You're, you're together with his death. God sees you together with his burial. God sees you together with his resurrection. You want to stand up togetherness? And we can look at some verses that use... That word, that's how we can be called the beloved of God. And when you look again at Romans chapter 1, those are the individuals that God is saying grace to you because of your togetherness with Christ. Grace to you. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. But the way God says grace to the beloved of God and the grace that he offers to someone who has not yet believed. It's not in the same realm. It's not in the same sense. Amen. They are an unbeliever is not the call. It's not called the beloved of God. Amen. They are not called saints. Is this the dispensation of the grace of God? Yes. Let's look for a moment back at verse 7. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, to you, and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a peace that the beloved of God has, that the saints of God have with God because your togetherness with Christ. That the individual who is an unbeliever, they don't have that togetherness with Christ, right? They are not, they are not accepted in the beloved because they have not accepted the gospel. Amen. So it's a peace that we have that they don't. There's a grace to you that we have that they don't have. And it's something that I think I want to be, I want to become more careful of than when, that when I see the word grace to you, it caused me to relook at the opening of Paul's letters and his epistles. When he said grace to you, he's talking to individuals who are already saved and sealed. You got to catch this. God is not imputing the trespasses unto, unto individuals who are not saved right now, but it's, a, but it's a grace that's in Christ that they do not yet have. Amen. That's the significance of universal reconciliation, not universal salvation. Amen. You catch that? Grace to you. You got to make this significant. Because the scripture makes it significant, not because I said so. Uh, the word together. Give me a brief definition of the word together as you bring this to a close. The word together. Somebody Joined. define that word. Joined. Joined. Amen. Joined. Combined. Anyone else? Combined. Combined. Absolute. Together. Into, one, into or in one gathering. Yeah. In one company. In one mass. In one place. In one body. In one union. Collectively. To combine forming a whole. You have to recognize that's exactly how God sees you. He sees me and you whole because we are in Christ. Amen. That's the big deal when we talk about how our position covers our justification, sanctification, and our glorification. Because of who we are in, God combines the merits of Christ and imputes them to our account. 
That's why it's the no combination understanding that we can bring, that scripture brings to our renewed mind. Amen? Colossians 2 and 10 reads, and ye are complete in who? In him, which is the head of all principality and power. Romans 6, 5. Let's go there briefly. Romans 6, 5. It reads, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, we've been planted together in the likeness of his death. You see that? Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things, the word together is what we're hanging on to. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 reads, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And have raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? This is our peace. This is our beloved position. Called to be saints. We always link it to in Christ. We always link it to in him. And when we do so, you've got to recognize and understand when we are sealed, we are sealed because God has combined. He has made a whole of Christ's righteousness, the righteousness of God being imputed into our account. One, one place, one union. Amen. Colossians 2 and 12, this, this is a, a, a Colossians 2 and 2. Paul is uh, praying, he says, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love. Once again, when we see the word heart, we understand that the scripture, especially in this portion of scripture, is talking about our what? It's talking about our minds. That our hearts, that our minds might be comforted being knit together in love and to all the riches of the full assurance of what? Understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Colossians 2.13 reads, And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, have ye quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. 2.19 And not holding the head, this is what certain individuals need to do and, and, or have not been doing, not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increase with the increase of God. Our growth, our growth is based on us having the renewed mind and being in a union with the mind of Christ through the word rightly divided in this dispensation of the grace of God. Amen. Your growth is based on, hear me. Your growth is based on the understanding of how much of an impact your togetherness with Christ can affect how you think, how you live, and how you even pursue to give and bring God glory. Amen. It's all based on you emphasizing I'm in Christ, Amen. on you emphasizing I'm in Him, on you emphasizing this togetherness, you emphasizing I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Amen. You emphasize, and this is important because when I, Romans chapter 1 verse 7, that's, that has to be an absolute mentality that we have as we continue to read this, as we continue to read Romans. We're reading, recognizing who we are together with. We know why we are called the beloved of God. And it has nothing to do with our works. It has nothing to do with what we stopped doing and what we started doing. It has everything to do with our position, our togetherness being positioned in Christ. It has everything to do with that. Everything to do with that. And the word together is, 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 is not in this verse, but it glorifies 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have to learn to grasp and understand One of the most greatest togetherness verses in all the scripture, and as we close with Galatians 2 and 20. Galatians 2 and 20, and it reads, 
I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. <clears throat> I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is rampant throughout the Apostle Paul's mindset. Amen. This, this is the joy that Paul had to get him through when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you see all of the perils and the perils and the perils and the troubles. Does our togetherness with Christ is the emphasis or one of the essential things that when you look at Romans, we're going to recognize how we are together with his death, together with his burial, together with his resurrection, and that is a first-time doctrine that this togetherness has with a seal that we need to hang on to for dear life. Amen? Amen.